<laughs> anyway. Oh. God, we, we are so grateful to be here before you, to be able to worship you, the miracle maker, the one who can bring the dead to life. And you, you did it with your son, and you do it with us when we surrender ourselves to you. So would you continue to, to be doing that? Um, would you bring life to us today? And not just here, Lord, but uh, we, we lay our burdens before you as well and those we care about. We're, we're thinking about Anne's brother, John, um, who um, it's, it's still unclear how much brain damage he's suffered. And I know that Anne's very concerned there. I'm thinking about a couple of close friends of mine who are struggling with cancer right now. And, uh, and I know each person here would be able to think of someone instantly who they would lift up and, and, and say, Lord, would you bring life into this situation? Whether that is breathing physical life and bringing healing or life into a relationship or life into a situation, but you can. You can do miracles. And, uh, and we, we pray that you would. God, uh, we lift up Dave and Jesse, and we thank you. Uh, that that part of our family, that family who are part of us, are, are working in another part of the world, um, sharing the life of Jesus um, in practical ways and in spiritual ways with the people that are around them. We pray that you would watch over them. We pray that you would meet their needs and open up the administrative avenues for them to do what they're doing. And, and we pray, Lord, that they would, they would, together with their team, be effective servants for your kingdom on this earth. And we pray now that you would come and help us understand your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right. Thank you guys so much for leading us. <clears throat> Felix, are we rolling? On the, right on. That's awesome. Okay. So this morning, I wanted to uh, take a look with you at something different. We, we ended our series on family values, and uh, today we're just going to do a one-off um, because um, several months ago, one of, uh, one of uh, the, the ladies on our leadership team mentioned to me, I just feel like I need to grieve sometimes um, what's going on. Not just, not just to, to, to do anything, but uh, to process our losses. And, and I thought, wow, I need to talk about that at some point in time because it's a real thing. And so we're going to do that today. And uh, the title of our message this morning is Songs of Grief and Anger. You're going to see that in a minute. If you want to take a look already at Psalm 137, that's where we're going to be this morning. Um, and and this, this phrase has come into my mind so much recently, and then uh, Blair actually brought it up this week again, and, uh, and, and she said she was thinking it this week too, this phrase, and, and it is this, are you serious? <laughs> Have you thought that in the last while? <laughs> are, you, <laughs> are, you, are you kidding me? <laughs> and, uh, and, and, uh, and she had one of those moments, and I've had lots of those moments. And, um, and, and it's funny, even last night, um, last night was Halloween. I don't know how you feel about that, but I, uh, anyway, there's, uh, there's this parade of costumes at our door. And uh, most of the costumes are predictable every year because they, you know, they're kind of a rehash of whatever kids' movie was popular during the year, um, uh, or not, or you know, it might not even be kids' movies. But but when the three-year-old in the killer clown mask and with the bloody machete showed up at my door, and I look at these, you know, parents that are raising this child, and I think, are you kidding me? For real. I mean, the, the only good thing about that is at three years old, you probably won't remember that, but I don't know how many other traumatic memories you're going to have. Um, and I just shook my head. I gave the candy, but I just shook my head. Another time, uh, it was a few years ago, the couple of guys show up my door too late, right? There's that time past which you shouldn't be trick-or-treating. A couple of guys show up my door, knock on the door too late, and they weren't even dressed up, you know, and they're teenagers. And I'm thinking... You are old enough to have jobs. Go to Walmart, buy your own candy. But, <laughs> but they show up at my door and trick or treat, you know. And uh, and I just in display. I said, "Well, what are you guys dressed as?" And and the the one kid. I told some of you this. The one kid says, "I'm him and he's me." <laughs> and I thought, 
Okay, okay, you get candy. That's, that's really good. You know, but we've had those, you know, are you kidding me moments. And then, uh, you know, in, in the last couple of weeks, I've had some more are you serious moments. I had a moment like that when I went to a coffee shop and, you know, there's the plexiglass in front of the server. I get that. That makes sense to me. You know, we're, we're, you're going to stop some, some spray there. And, uh, I mean, I talked to somebody who said, have you ever cleaned the plexiglass at the end of a shift? There's a lot of spray. Like, it's a real thing. Um, and then there's the little arrows on the floor. Okay, that's fine. But then they wanted me to wear a mask to the till where there's plexiglass. Um, but I could remove the mask once I got to my table and, you know, because I can't drink the coffee through the mask. And I felt just, <clears throat> are, you, are you serious, is what I felt. And I don't know, I had, to, I had to just kind of assess myself after that, and I don't know why I felt like pouting like a little kid, why I felt like not complying, right? Why? Like, what's the big deal? Honestly, what's the big deal? But it just, to me, felt onerous. It felt like a step too far after so many steps in a direction I never wanted to take. And you may have felt like that a lot this year too. And, and, and by the way, I'm, I'm not even talking just about COVID. There's so much going on in our world that is, there, there's places we're going that we don't feel like going. And then every month we get new orders and we have to adjust again. And I'll tell you what, it's tiring. I find it's tiresome Um, because I know that every time as a church, every time as a church that we do one more thing that we're required to do, and our leadership's posture is we are going to comply with the law, we're going to obey the law, but but every time we do that, it's like, what kind of pushback are we going to get on this, you know, and it's tiring and it's unfamiliar and it's time consuming and bothersome and I don't like it. In fact, I hate it. I hate this. I hate all of this. And uh, it's like Reg said months ago, I, I, he, he said, we, we just live in a country where we're not used to being told what to do, right? We've, we've grown up very, very privileged, and uh, we're just not being used to uh, being told what to do. I remember when my dad, back, way back when they made seatbelts mandatory, and my dad would wear the seatbelt over his shoulder, but he refused to click it in. <laughs> They're not telling me what to you know, I don't need to wear it seatbelt. And, <laughs> and I just, yeah, I didn't know the word hypocrisy at that point in time as a child, but, but I knew that what I was seeing was just over your shoulder so the cop won't see you, but and I, anyway, the cops figured it out. Um, <clears throat> but today we're going to look at this biblical metaphor of exile. We're going to look at the metaphor of exile, of not being at home where you want to be. And Jerusalem fell to the Babylonian Empire around 587 B.C. And the people of Judah were captured. And then they were taken 900 miles. They had to do that walking into a strange new land where they remained for many years. And where they grieved the loss of everything that they had called home. And the question is, how are we, the people of God, going to sing the song of the Lord? in a strange land that we're living in, even though we didn't choose this. And people find themselves in a lot of places that they feel like they've lost what they called home. Uh, and, and that can apply to COVID restrictions. But just as much, I would, in fact, even more, you think about the loss of what it feels like to be home if, if, if somebody loses a loved one. That's a, that's a whole other level of losing home. Or people that walk through a time of financial pressure, and it's not like it once was, and I don't have the security I did. And, or you think about people who walk through the pain and loss of a divorce, and that does not feel like home anymore. Or people with chronic physical ailments, and they don't feel at home in their own bodies anymore. And what does the Bible say about living in exile? A lot, as it turns out. Um, Paul wrote most of his letters from prison. We got good things out of Somebody being in a place they didn't want to be. The Apostle John experienced the revelation while he was in exile. The books of Esther and Daniel are ours with these amazing stories of God's people in exile. So the Bible says something about this, and today we're going to look at a psalm that was written in exile. And here here it is. It's Psalm 137. We're going to go through it a step at a time. And it starts like this, by the rivers of Babylon, 
we sat and wept when we remembered Zion. There on the poplars, we hung our harps. I'm just, I'm, I'm putting it up. I can't play this anymore. For there our captors asked us for songs. Our tormentors demanded songs of joy. They said, sing us one of the songs of Zion. How can we sing the songs of the Lord while in a foreign land? Let's pray. Lord, uh, we collectively feel like we are living in a strange land right now. And then individuals feel like they are living far from the place that they felt comfortable, the place that they wanted to call home. And your word speaks to us. So by your spirit now, will you enable us to understand what you are saying? Would you bring hope? Would you bring comfort? Would you bring strength and clarity? In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. So as I read those verses, uh, just the beginning, there, there's two emotions that are prominent as we begin, and those emotions are fatigue and sadness. Have you ever felt those? It says we sat. We sat. We just sat down, and then we wept. The people sit beside the river. They're, they're mourning as they share memories of home, and the drooping branches of those willow trees around them, the poplars, the willows around, alongside the river, it seemed to weep right with them. Their masters are asking for songs, but the people are unable to sing because they're absolutely overwhelmed with sorrow for all they've lost. They miss the way it was, but it's really hard to worship right now. And when they hear someone saying, you can still have services, why don't you sing your songs? It sounds more like a taunt than an offer of freedom. And the psalmist expresses what people are feeling. Are you serious, is what the people are feeling. And throughout this year, a lot of what used to be safe and familiar, the the rhythms and routines of normal life have been lost. 2020 has been a hard year. And that, you know, the other day I I, I saw um, Sean Connery, who, I don't like, I don't know what connection he has with the church, but church people are like, oh no, 2020 has gone too far. Sean Connery has died. (laughs) Um, And... um, and, 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 and I think it's just this response of one more thing, and it's become for many people this season of captivity, a, a strange land that we're living with in which we are still learning how to live. And, and then add to that, you know, uh, an October that had three times as much rain in Williams Lake as usual, and I just read in the news last night, 300 basements are reported in Williams Lake to be flooding, you know, and then economic collapse. And you just scratch your head and you say, are you serious? Like one more thing. And I want to ask you, in what ways have you in the past year felt collectively with other people or in your own life and the things you've gone through, have you felt the deep, dark ache of loss? Because I think of those who don't have any family, who have walked through times of utter isolation. They're so alone. I think of those who have lost jobs of those who have been unable to be with family when they needed it most. My friend can't come home from where he's being treated for cancer because he tested positive for COVID. And he's praying that it's a false positive. But they tested him again, and it came up positive again. And, you know, and all of the restrictions that surround that in a time of suffering. Are you serious? In what ways have you felt those kind of things? And churches, our church, we, you know, churches have lost their rhythms of meeting and worshiping together. And in many ways, we are grieving the loss. And though you may not think that, if there's this something, an ache, an agitation inside of you, that might be grief because of the loss of something that used to feel very much like home. And we're wondering, what does it mean to sing the Lord's song in this strange new landscape? And I want to tell you that the psalm tells us, in fact, the psalms throughout the psalms tell us that there is a time to do nothing else but stop and grieve. Before we do anything, before we react, sometimes you just need to sit. Sometimes you just need to weep and admit what you missed. 
And so throughout this message, I'm going to pause and, and say some prayers. And I want to encourage you to, to pray with me. Um, and sometimes, as you know, I like to pray with my hands held out because I'm saying, God, I got nothing and I'm ready for what you have. So, and it's a surrender kind of prayer. And if you want to join me in that, you can. But let's pray just now. And Lord, in this moment of quiet, I bring all of this, whatever this is for me or for my friends here, we bring all of this to you, Father God. 2020 has been hard. And right now, I am tired, Lord. Right now, I might need a good cry. And I am so grateful that you are okay with that. And so I surrender it all to you. I accept where I am right now and how I'm feeling right now. And your word declares to me that you accept it too. Thank you. I ask you, Father God, to draw close to all who have been overwhelmed with sorrow, those who have felt paralyzed by the ache of loss. Comfort them and care for them, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Strange land, strange land. But then we go on in the psalm, and we're going to talk about a strange song. I, I, continuing to re reflect on this psalm of grief and lament by the people in exile, um, the people of Judah had been conquered by the Babylonians, Jerusalem has been destroyed, and the people have been forced to leave their homes. Uh, they've been forced to to live in an enemy territory. They've been carried off, and now they are living so far away in another place entirely. It must seem like to them like another world, the land of Babylon. And they, and they sing. How can we sing the songs of the Lord while in a foreign land? If I forget you, Jerusalem, may my right hand forget its skill. It's, it's saying, may I never be able to play a harp again if I forget Jerusalem. May my tongue cling to the roof of my mouth. May I never be able to sing again if I do not remember you, if I do not consider Jerusalem my highest joy. The Israelites have lost their freedom. They've lost their economy. They've lost their homes. So many of them have lost members of their family, and this is a song of homesickness. It's also a song of lament for something that's so important to their faith and their identity, Jerusalem itself. What was Jerusalem all about? That's where the temple is. The temple, the place of worship, the place where God's glory came down and dwelled and people could connect with God. Now, we know, we know that God is not confined to a temple. Amen? We know that God is not confined to a city, to a place, and yet in the middle of times of upheaval, we can feel like saying, worship, worship, when it's like this, to worship now feels like admitting defeat. It feels like saying, well, if I just kind of move on and worship, I'm saying it'll always be like this. And that's what they were trying to say. If I forget Jerusalem and say, this is all there is now, may I, may I never worship again? May I never play again? May I never sing again? I don't even want to worship if I can't have it the way it was, is what they're saying. Have you, have you ever felt like that? And the exile in Babylon, though, it lasted for decades some of the people who would have been singing this song would never see their homeland again. And I wonder at what point did they realize it wasn't ever going to go back to normal. And if you've ever been through a time of loss in your life, whatever that loss may be, there is that point where you realize, I'm not going back to the way it was. I'm just not going back to the way it was. I can't. Some scholars, though, have suggested that the time of the Babylonian exile could have been the time when the Jews found a new way to gather together. Could have been the time where the, the, the shift of focus went from the temple, although they did go back and eventually rebuild the temple, but when the shift in focus went from the temple to the synagogue, when people found other ways to gather. And was it, was it their ability to accept the present that helped the Israelites discover new ways to live as the people of God. And I've got a question for you. Is it possible that in your season of captivity, in your season of exile, it could actually become the birthplace of a new unexpected freedom? How might 
I want you to ask this question, and I want us to, as a church to ask the question, how might God actually want to grow my faith, your faith, our faith, and the way we do things during these strange days? And so we pray. Would you pray with me? Father, normal is comfortable and it's familiar. Father, it's scary to think that some things may never go back to the way they were before. We confess our fears to you. We confess our preference for the way it once was. And you know what that looks like in each person's life. And yet, Lord Jesus, we choose to follow you today. And we choose to worship you in the potential that you have. For this present moment. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Amen. Strange song. But the psalm, if you've looked ahead, there is also strange anger in this psalm. As we come back to the psalm, we, we encounter some of the most disturbing words that you will find in the Bible. Today we're going to look at some really famous words in the Bible. A little bit later we're going to look at one of the most famous verses that there is that people love to go to out of context, and we're going to look at it in context today. But we're going to see at the end of this psalm some of the most disturbing words the Bible has, and it's tempting to skip over verses like these. I've never preached on them before because they're hard, but we're going to stop and we're going to think about one of the most bitter and bloodthirsty parts of the entire Bible. It's not pleasant, but maybe that's part of the point. Psalm 137, going on from verse 7, says, Remember, Lord, what the Edomites did on the day Jerusalem fell. Tear it down, they cried. Tear it down to, their foundation, or to its foundations. Daughter Babylon, doomed to destruction. Happy is the one who repays you according to what you have done to us. Happy is the one who seizes your infants and dashes them against the rocks. And that, that kind of violence is shocking. I mean, that is raw, unprocessed rage right there. The Babylonians were famous for their excessive violence against people when they conquered them. And it shows up here. You can read between the lines exactly what the Babylonians did when they broke into Jerusalem. And it is almost too much to contemplate what the people of Jerusalem went through when that conquering army took them over. And that was commonplace in those days. They were famous for it. It's how they instilled fear in the people that they conquered. It's also part of how they ensured that the people they conquered wouldn't have an army again in 20 years. And so the psalmist raises up the Edomites. Who are they? Well, that's Judah's neighbor and, and their bitter enemy, and the Edomites are those people who celebrate everything that's constantly there, nagging at God's people, and, and the ones who celebrate when God's people suffer. And the psalmist says, remember them, because they gloated. Tear it down, they said when Jerusalem fell. And then the psalmist fantasizes, fantasizes about their enemies, the Babylonians, suffering the way that they had suffered. Oh, turn it back on them. May they get what we got. Now, clearly, that's not the way of Jesus. Clearly, these are not the words of Jesus. Jesus commands us, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. But that's not what we see here. And the question is, why have these words survived? Somebody could have edited this out of the Bible, and they didn't. God made sure these words got to us. Why are they still there? Because the Psalms teach us how to pray. They teach us what we're allowed to say to God. They teach us what, that, that God cares about the deepest things that we're going through. I mean, you, you've thought these things. You've seen somebody do something horrible and stupid and thought, oh my goodness, somebody should just murder them. Are my prayers, though, ever too polished and too polite? Is, the, is there a place in the way that I pray to make room for honest disappointment and honest rage? Again, think of all the upheaval of the last year. And you know how tempting it is to try to find some sort of comfort in finding someone to blame for it all. I mean, that, that's what a lot of people do. 
I'm going through discomfort. I don't know what to do with it. Just give me someone to hate. I want fairness. I want justice. I want someone to answer for all of this. And people do it all the time. We feel those feelings. They're real. They're in us. God knows it, so you may as well tell Him. Let's pray. Father, I take time now to express my frustration, my anger, my disappointment to you. Lord, I hold open my heart before you. I confess rather than conceal the turmoil of my inner world. I bring it all out. This is what I'm feeling. This is what I'm angry about. This is what makes me uh, shake my fist. Amen. You may need to take more time than that to do some fist shaking. Um, this week as I prepared this message, when I was sure I was alone in here, <laughs> I had some words. And, and I mean, I, I, I poured it out. Some of the things that are pressing on me that make me so angry. And I told God, and He's okay. He listens. I don't blame Him, but He listens. And there the, uh, the, the Apostle Paul writes, Do not take revenge, my dear friends. And we all agree with that. We know that's the Christian way. Don't take revenge. But Paul doesn't just say, don't take revenge. He continues. He says, leave room for God's wrath, for it's written, it's mine to avenge. I will repay, says the Lord. What on earth does it mean to leave room for God's wrath? Well, you know, there's a the Christian counselor who's dealt with people who have suffered unimaginable abuse. And she said, I find enormous comfort. We can find enormous comfort in God's anger and His judgment. When we hear the most shocking stories of evil, we need to know that it won't go on forever. Amen? It will end. That God will ultimately resist evil. He'll stop evil. He will punish those who hate and hurt others in such evil ways. And it is, it is so much easier for us to process through our stuff and to, and to forgive. It's easier to forgive and to live at peace when we believe that vengeance belongs to God. Would you agree? And so you can think of anyone who's hurt you or hurt those that you love, and you can yield those grievances, and you can yield that desire for justice to God. And so we shift out of this psalm now and look at another book that talks about this exile. And we're going to go to, to wrap up with Jeremiah the prophet because Jeremiah was there. He saw all of this go down. He watched it happen. And he was actually one of the few who stayed behind in Jerusalem, which doesn't mean he got off easy because Jerusalem was devastated, but he stayed behind. And in, in, in his book, in the, in the book of Jeremiah, there's a point at which he writes a letter to the exiles that are in Babylon because they're being swayed by false prophets. There's people who are rising up and saying, this isn't God's will. This won't last. You're not meant to be here in Babylon. And then there's other leaders who are saying to God's people that are back in, in Jerusalem, we should stand up against the Babylonians. We should rebel. We should resist. And this is what Isaiah writes because he, he opposed both of those false prophets. And he says this, this is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says to all those I carried into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. Build houses and settle down. Plant gardens and eat what they produce. Marry and have sons and daughters. Find wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage so that they too may have sons and daughters. Increase in number there and do not decrease. In all of this, he's saying, this may be a while, is what he's trying to communicate. Also seek the peace and prosperity of the city to which I have carried you into exile. Pray to the Lord for it, because if it prospers, you too will prosper. Did you catch that? God says, I carried you into exile. Can we just stop and realize that if we believe 
that God is in control of everything, that we also must believe that God is in control of now, that you are right now, you are right now where God has put you. It's not comfortable. It doesn't feel like home, but accept the change. Settle down and learn to live where God has led you. It is part of His plan. It could take some time. And so we pray. God, I may not like where I find myself right now. I want so badly to go back to how it was. But I believe you are in control and that even this is part of your plan. You have me where I am for a reason. Don't let me miss what you're doing in this moment. Help me find and rebuild the rhythms of life right here. Lift me out of my grief. Teach me to pray for and work for the good of those who are in this strange land with me. Amen. And now one of the most famous verses of the Bible, but this time in context. This verse is not about you and your happy wishes and, you know, (laughs) rainbows and lollipops kind of verse. This is a verse that comes out of a place of pain and exile And this is what the Lord says, when 70 years are completed for Babylon, that's a long time, (laughs) when 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will come to you and fulfill my good promise to bring you back to this place. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. Then you will call on me and come and pray to me and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. What that says is that whatever you're going through, whatever your place of exile is right now, it won't last forever. So grieve, get angry if you have to, but don't pitch a fit and don't sit and pout. This is an invitation to pray. Look to God. Don't don't get so fixated on your losses that you lose sight of Him. He is in control. His plans for you are good plans, even in the place you don't want to be. And in time, He says, I will bring you back. In time, He would visit His people in the person of Jesus Christ. And so we can rejoice, and we do today, as as we're going to, in a moment, move to the communion table, and our musicians can come on forward already. Um, we rejoice in the cross of Christ because here's the thing, and I, and I love the songs that Isaac has picked for this morning because we have, we have sung this truth already. The cross of Christ is where all of God's righteous wrath was poured out on Jesus. I want you to think about this. Every evil doer, every corrupt leader, every liar, every cheater, every abuser, Every sinner who has kept their sin secret will one day pay fully for that sin, including me and including you, unless unless someone else suffers the wrath. And that's what Jesus did. He suffered for me and for anyone who will put their faith in Him. Justice was served unto Jesus. All of, all of the wrath that that psalm writer prayed for, dashed their children against the rocks. That's what Jesus went through for me and for you. And we can forgive because we've been forgiven so much. And so as we, as we come to the communion table, and in a moment I'm going to invite you, just as we sing, you can make your way to one of the tables that's around the room, pick up a cup, pick up uh, a, a, a little cup with bread. And just take it back to your seat. And we'll consume them together at the end. But as you, as you come, confess to Him. Confess to Him what you are tempted to turn to for comfort and for control instead of turning to God. We've all got our places. Confess that to Him now. Confess the ways that you've questioned His plans for Him or His plans for you. Surrender. Surrender to Him. Confess your impatience with His plans. 
rather than praying that he change everything, pray, pray that he change your heart and that he grow you even during this time of exile. And so, Lord, we thank you. We thank you for the cross of Christ. We thank you that you, Lord Jesus, suffered the righteous wrath of God in our place so that we can be forgiven and have a good and eternal hope. We thank you that for those who trust you, God, it is true that you have plans to prosper and not to harm, plans to give us hope and a future, and we have that in Jesus. So we call out to you. We pray to you. We seek you with our hearts today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's sing together, and, uh, and as we sing, come and grab one of the elements, and, or grab the elements for yourself, and, and then I'll lead us in, in taking those elements in a little bit. So 